All right, guys, it looks like we are live. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today on Standing for Truth. On Standing for Truth, we focus on the truth of biblical creation. And today we have an awesome guest with us. I am extremely excited that Michael J. Ord can be with us today for this incredibly important presentation and topic. Mike has done a great deal of amazing work on creation and the global flood of Noah. And he is best known for his work on the biblical ice age, which is exactly what we are going to be discussing here today is the ice age. So I want to thank everybody in the audience. Uh, please also tag me with your questions at Standing for Truth. That way I will uh, see your questions. Typically our chats get, uh, get lively and today is definitely going to be a good show. So I am going to bring in uh, Mike Ord and our award-winning co-host, George Bond. Thanks so much. Uh, gentlemen, Mike, once again, it, it's so great to have you here. Hi, you're welcome. Well, I want to say, uh, again, thanks for giving us your time for today's important show. And... We have a lot of new viewers and subscribers since your previous presentation with us on the global flood and the recessive stage of, of the uh, flood. Um, if you wanted to take a, a few moments to give everybody a brief introduction uh, as to who you are, maybe what you're doing in terms of creation research and why you find this, this topic so important, uh, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well... We're, we have a huge amount of challenges out there, not only from the secular world, the university, and even from our neighbors and friends on, how do you explain this? How do you explain that? And so um, I, I, I deal with the questions on the flood, and there's a huge amount of questions of the flood. And by the way, bringing the flood back to Earth history solves uh, these, solves many of them. Now, some of them are unsolved, mainly because there's, we don't have the data for a lot of them or the time to do it. But um, it excites me that we do have answers. And if a person is willing to be patient and check us out and see what we say about certain things, they would be most impressed. We have over 50 years of uh, creation research uh, uh, that we've done, like the Creation Research Society Quarterly. Journal of Creation Answers Research Journal. So we have answers, and I'm just happy to be part of that. And so it, it excites me to to do this. And there's a lot, lot to do, as uh, I'm sure a lot of people know. Amen. Amen. Great introduction, Mike. And I want to recommend your previous presentation and audience Q&A with us to everybody in the chat, anybody who's new to this channel, please check that out. I do have it in the description box of this video as well as some links directly to some articles that you can find from Mike on, on the uh, creation.com website. So uh, we've also got George, George here with us. Thank you so much, George. Uh, a few introductory words from yourself. Uh, good morning. Uh, actually, very early in the morning. Uh, <laughs> by the way, uh, SFT, I go to my mailbox every morning looking for that award. I still haven't got it. <laughs> so, good morning. I'm going to travel morning, to Australia and deliver it to you personally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I? Can I? Um, can I start the proceedings by um, by saying it's a pleasure to have uh, have you here again, Mike. Um, uh, for those that ha haven't really uh, had the pleasure, we had Mike around uh, six to eight weeks ago regarding the receding floodwaters. I, I urge those that haven't watched it to do so. It's it's in our playlist. For for anyone who hasn't read much creationist material, you'll find Michael's volumes, and I mean volumes of papers and articles, is written on many creationist websites. He's... Um, Wealth of information and work is cited by many other creationists also. I, I believe, uh, Mike, last time we spoke, you said you had a list of over 500 projects that uh, you would love to complete. So <laughs> I guess in your case, it's it's a work in progress, Mike. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have <laughs> about 15 projects going, but uh, I, I keep saying I have 500 years worth of research left to go. <laughs> well, Mike. 
Well, Mike, uh, true, true to my form, I always start off with a bit of a joke. Uh, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be happy to know that uh, uh, some scientists from Berserkly uh, were successful in getting a grant uh, in order to determine the height of a, of a flagpole. So they looked and looked at the pole. They've, they had their toolbox and their measuring tapes and everything, and they couldn't figure out how we're going to do this. We don't have a ladder that long. So a, wom a woman walked by and asked, what, what, what were you doing? What are you trying to do? Ah, oh, we're supposed to find the height of this flagpole, said one of them, but we don't have a ladder long enough. Oh, well, the woman looked at the um, uh, spanner and a tape measure from their toolbox. She began to loosen a couple of bolts at the base of the flagpole and laid it down on the ground, took the measurement and announced 6.5 metres and walked away. One scientist shook his head and laughed. <laughs> she said, he said, a lot of good that does us. We, we ask for the height and she gives us the length. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> have, Very have good. Mike, Mike, back to uh, seriously now. Uh, having watched your video on the Ice Age twice now, I'll, I'll admit, I, I have to express my ignorance before having seen it. I was not aware of a lot of what you what you stated in that video, but rather than steal your thunder, I'll, I'll wait till your presentation. Uh, for those uh, that are listening, of particular interest was how the mammoths uh, and um, other mammals got to the far north, and the freezing of the mammoth's stomach contents, and how they preserved in the permafrost. My research shows that as far north as Greenland. There is abundance evidence of moderate cli climate just seven mm -hmm. to 800 years ago. Now, creation research, our, our friend uh, John McKay and Joseph Hubbard have a documentary on this called Fire and Ice. For those wanting to check that out and see what evidence I'm actually talking about, you, you can find that in that documentary. However, I'm, I'm sure our audience are here to hear from you, Mike. And watch you rather than me. So I'll uh, let you take it away. The floor okay. is yours, Mike. We can get right into the presentation if you'd like to, and I can share your screen as well. Okay. Thank you for that uh, introduction, George, as well, and a good joke to start us off with. I appreciate it. And here we go, Mike. I've got your screen pulled up. Can you all yeah. see it? Yep. Yes. Looks good. Looks good, Mike. Okay. This is uh, my standard talk on the Ice Age. And the title of as an Ice Age, only the Bible can explain it. Very provocative subtitle there, but uh, I will explain it as I go. Anyway, there's hundreds of earth science challenges. And here's a list I just wrote down over five-minute period. Some of these I've worked on. Um, here's more of them. Anyway, the Ice Age is one of these challenges that uh, the sector scientists give us. So this is going to be about the Ice Age. And through the Ice Age model, biblical model, we can answer some of these other ones that I've listed here. The results of these challenges, um, there's hundreds of them. I read about them all the time in the secular literature. They cause many to doubt God's word. And they cause tens of thousands of atheists and agnostics. Some of the, the people think these challenges are so solid that the Bible can't explain it. It's caused tens of millions of Christians to fit evolution and deep time into the Bible as a result. It's enhanced the local flood myth. myth. It's resulted in a mass exodus of youth. So these challenges are important for us to answer. And this is what I spent 45 years doing. A closer look at challenges. Many do not realize that most of these are also challenges to evolutionary geology. When I research a topic, I find out that a lot of times when you dig below the surface that uh, it's challenging to them. They can't explain it. In fact, there's numerous challenges to deep time and uniformitarianism. Also, we have to realize that we're not gonna solve all challenges. 
And one of the reasons is, is because there's not enough known in their sciences. So we got to be patient with challenges and check into them and do research. And many re really do not know that the creation flood ice age model has solutions to many of these challenges already. Some challenges take a long effort, long time. So it's not going to be done overnight. We have a lack of workers and funds. So those are some of the reasons why we have some unanswered challenges. Anyway, let's talk about the Ice Age. First of all, what is an Ice Age? Well, uh, you can't really find much of a definition except that it's a great increase in snow and ice. Currently, 10% of our continents have ice on them now, mainly Greenland and Antarctica. During the Ice Age, 30% of the land surface was covered by ice, mainly in the, in the high latitudes and locally down to the mid latitudes and in many mountainous areas. Also, it was the last major event in Earth history. Last major event. And I'm going to come back and revisit that at the end. Okay, actually, there are five Ice Age periods, according to to the secular uniformitarian uh, there's the pleistocene less than 2.6 million years the late paleozoic about 280 million the late ordovician 450 million late Cam precambrian several of them during that time period some of them supposedly uh, are global glaciations which uh, brings up an interesting conundrum is how do you glaciate the globe and not only that how do you melt it <laughs> Big problems. I've dealt with these before. And also there's a mid Precambrian glaciation. So they have generally five major ice age periods. There's some minor ones in between. Anyway, it's the Pleistocene is, is the real ice age. And they claim there's 50 ice ages now in the Pleistocene, but it's mainly their last that is, is the one that's correlated to the biblical ice age. The reason for the other many is due to deep sea cores, wiggles in deep sea cores. You don't see that evidence on land. Anyway, the Pleistocene Ice Age is real, but only the last is equal to the post-flood Ice Age. The other four can be explained by gig gigantic submarine landslides during the flood. Because they're from the flood. And I wrote a book about this uh, quite a while ago, documenting this. Ancient Ice Ages or gigantic submarine landslides. Anyway, here's the challenge of the Ice Age that they give us. Each ice age takes 100,000 years, at least in the last million years. Before that, it was every 40,000 years, they claim. The glacial phase is approximately 90,000 years, and the interglacial phase is 10,000. Now, we live in an interglacial phase right now called the Holocene. And there's been, like I said, about 50 regular repeating ice ages during the past 2.6 million years of various intensities. That's what they claim now. And then they they, that's the challenge that they give us. And here's a quote from the anti-creationist Arthur Strahler. He says, increasing the duration of the Ice Age by a factor of about 10 greatly increases the stress upon the creation scientists who must compress the events of 15 million years into 4,000 years of post-flood time. Well, this guy's got a huge book with challenges for us. And... He did a lot of research, so he 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 looked into our stuff, and so he got some things right, like the post-flood time, and other things he's got wrong. So what's this increasing the time by uh, ten? Well, they decided uh, because of um, other geological phenomena, mainly ice rafted debris in deep sea cores, dated as Oligocene or Eocene, early Cenozoic, Paleogene for other people. Uh, and therefore they decided that, well, these came from Antarctica. Antarctica must be 10 times the age we thought it was. So overnight it becomes 10 times the age where it started about mm, 40 million years ago uh, and the Eocene reached a maximum f at 15 million years. Uh, so that's the challenge it gives us. We, we need to not only explain the ice age, but also the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets and that they say takes 10 times as more, more time. What do we do with challenges? This is my theme verse for all research. In fact, it's a great theme verse for life. Examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 from the NASB. 
I can't emphasize more of that word carefully. You got to go beyond the superficial. See, you can go on on online and and see a lot of um, uh, challenges they give us. Like I saw one the other day uh, on the Ice Age. So, and it sounds kind of convincing, but when you look at it carefully and bring back the Bible into Earth history, you know, there's a whole different uh, way of looking at it, a whole different explanation. And so this is my theme verse for research. I examine everything carefully. So I need to kind of back up and kind of, um, first of all, answer a few questions. Uh, was there really an ice age? See, there are some people, even a few creationists, that don't believe there was an ice age. Well, where are you going to test to find out whether there's an ice age? Well, you go to places that are glaciated currently and look and see what glaciers produce on the land. And then you see if, if these similar features are found elsewhere. And, of course, here's the beautiful Athabasca Glacier in the Canadian Rockies. And... It was out here in 1890. Practically all the glaciers in the world have um, shrunk due to a little global warming. I emphasize a little global warming. Um, but, but what you see glaciers do, they produce these ridges and mounds of all kinds of rocks. Uh, like here's one right here in front of it, a ridge of debris that was left. That's called a end moraine or, or terminal moraine and along the edges you find where the debris has been piled up along the side as the glacier advanced they're called lateral moraines and here is a, a picture of the lateral moraine to the north you see it's got some good sized boulders and it. it's just a pile of rocks various sizes all mixed up by the way i was young and stupid when i um <laughs> took this photo, I, I, I actually went up on this ice, uh, this Columbia Ice Fields, Athabasca Glacier, had a lot of crevasses, I was pretty dumb, but I survived. And then you find scratch boulders. The boulders are scratched because they, at the bottom of the glacier as it moves, the boulders scratch the bedrock and the boulders get scratched. And sometimes the boulders will shift because the ice is plastic, uh, can shift. And it could form scratches on the boulders in different directions. Like here, there's uh, two directions, right in here and right in here. So that's typical. And then the bedrock is scratched in the direction that it moves. These are typical of glaciated areas today. Do we see these areas in places that uh, are claimed to be glaciated? Indeed, we do. This is uh, west of where I used to live in Great Falls, Montana. I live now in Bozeman, Montana, uh, about 150 miles south. And here's the Rocky Mountain front uh, in the background. And in the foreground, you see this mound, of, uh, and you see boulders at the top. And it continues over here. You can see it's a, just a mound of debris, of, of actually rocks of all sizes. It was continuous in here at one time, but it probably broke through here because of a it dammed up a glacial lake and, and cut through here. And of course, that's where they put the reservoir. And when you look at the, the close up of the terminal moraine, you see rocks of all sizes in a jumbled uh, mixture, just exactly what you expect for glaciated areas. And then you find some scratched rocks in that terminal moraine. And when you hike up to the top of the Rocky Mountain front, this is the first cliff uh, in the Rocky Mountain front. It's 800 feet high, about 250 meters high. And yet you see the scratch bedrock moving from west to east and down into the high plains about 20 miles east to where it ended. So this area was glaciated. But th this area in the summertime gets up into the 80s or um, in centigrade, uh, uh, 20 to 30 degrees centigrade for high temperatures. And so no glacier is going to survive in the, in the Rocky Mountains or in the plains today. Very, very far from producing any glaciers. And then you find that a lot of the mountain areas in the western United States were glaciated. And glaciers came out of the mountain valleys onto plains, like here's one at Enterprise, Oregon, northeast Oregon. And you see this horseshoe-shaped feature right in here with a dammed up over deepened lake like a fjord. 
And when you, uh, this feature would not form in the flood, as uh, some people have, have tried to tell me. Anyway, this is a special shape from a glacier coming out onto a valley and piling up a lateral and a terminal moraine, like you see in presently glaciated area. And when you look from the from the lake level at the, the lateral moraine, you can see the trees for scale. This lateral moraine is 600 feet tall. When you look at the uh, what the, what's in the lateral moraine, you see it's rocks of all sizes. In a, a, and generally a finer grain matrix, like here's a granite rock right in here, a lot of granite in those mountains. So this area was glaciated. Enterprise, Oregon, Northeast Oregon gets up in the low 90s for high temperatures in the summertime. You couldn't glaciate the Wallawa Mountains today. It's very far from creating an ice cap there. And then you find all these erratic boulders. Here's a famous train of erratic boulders that stretch 600 kilometers from near Jasper, Alberta, Canada to Cutbank, Montana. This is a quartzite. Look how angular that is. By the way, this is John Wood Merapi for scale. This is southwest of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It couldn't have rolled down uh, in the flood. It had to be transported in an iceberg and deposited. And this probably was a glacial river between the Laurentide ice sheet in central and eastern Canada and the adjacent United States and, the, and to the west, the Cordillon ice sheet that, that covered the Rocky Mountains and moved down off the Rocky Mountain front for maybe about 50 kilometers. And here's a really interesting uh, boulder. This is about 180 ton. Argillite boulder. So you can see it's a shale. Argillite is a slightly metamorphic shale. It's in the Willamette Valley, southwest of Portland, Oregon. It's about 200 kilometers south of, of the furthest southern extent of the Cordillon Ice Sheet, which is Olympia, Washington. And by the way, this type of rock does not outcrop anywhere in the state of Oregon. And you couldn't have rolled this. Uh, by the way, it outcrops in nor uh, northern Idaho and western Montana, near where I live. And this part of the Belt Supergroup rock uh, from the Belt Basin, 20 kilometers plus of sediment in a deep hole deposited. Anyway, the, the glaciers, uh, uh, it's deposited down here. What's it doing down here? And it's angular. Well, the only explanation is the Lake Missoula flood, where the, the valleys of western Montana uh, ponded to 600 uh, uh, meters by an ice dam in northern Idaho. And then it broke through that ice dam and, and flooded eastern Washington and, and carved it up, moving uh, 80 miles an hour through there and moved through the Willamette Gorge and spread out uh, in, the, in the Vancouver, um, Portland area with all kinds of erratic boulders spread over the Willamette Basin, which is what you're seeing here. And this unique one was had to be carried by an iceberg from as far away as western Montana, which indicates that if you had a Lake Missoula flood and you had an ice sheet that was at least 2,500 feet thick in northern Idaho, you had an ice age. And here's a, a quick summary of the Lake Missoula flood. Here's the valleys of western Montana. I live down about in here, and it filled it up 2,000 feet deep right there. And it carved through that ice into Glacial Lake Columbia, and then it carved up uh, eastern Washington. 50 cubic miles of basalt and silt was eroded. The green areas were the channel uh, flowed. And here it is from space. You could see the path of the floodwater, the Lake Missoula flood. It was 10 times the combined uh, flow of all the rivers in the world, huge. They rejected it for 40 years because it was too biblical in scale until they realized that there's hundreds of pieces of evidence for this. And so when you add up all these areas where, where it shows glaciation, this is the general area of where it was glaciated, generally down into the mid-latitudes of, of the United States and the mountains of the way. This is schematic. It's not meant to be accurate. And here's, a, here's an area not glaciated somehow, right, in the... Uh, within uh, uh, 
about 300 kilometers north of its furthest extent. And here's Alaska. Only the uh, mountains of Alaska were glaciated, but the lowlands were not. Major mystery of science, which I will say something about towards the end. That's where you find the woolly mammoth fossils, the horses and the bisons in, in the lowlands of, of uh, Alaska. And then the same thing in, in Eurasia. Here's the general location of the ice. It's rather controversial how much ice was here, by the way. By the way, this is an old schematic from one of my books from the 90s. Uh, so that's questionable how much ice was here. And now they believe the Barent Sea north of Norway was glaciated. And some more mounds besides the Alps were glaciated here. It's just a schematic. The uh, central mountains of Asia, uh, the mountains of Siberia. Only the mountains, but not the lowlands. And that's where you find the woolly mammoth fossils by the millions, especially in the new Siberian islands here and in the, in the adjacent coastal area in the permafrost. Um, so this is the general location of the ice. 30% of the land surface was covered by ice during the ice age. So there was an ice age. Can mainstream sciences explain the ice age? Remember I said that they are always challenging us but I find that they're challenged also. But in order to know uh, what, whether they're challenged or not, we need to know what it takes for an ice age. What do we need? Here's the requirements for an ice age. Cooler summers. Winters are already cold enough most areas. In fact, most areas would benefit from for a warmer winter because the warmer the air, the more moisture it holds. So you can produce more snow. Then secondly, uh, greater snowfall. You need much more snowfall. And it has to not melt during the summer. So it builds up year by year. So it persists for many years. You just can't have a climate change for one year. By the way, how much uh, cooling are we talking about? How, what, are, what kind of numbers? Well, a man did a computer study of uh, to see where, where the one inch line or more snow areas occurred after the summer melt in Canada. And he cooled off the average summer temperatures of Canada by increments of two degrees centigrade, about three degrees Fahrenheit. So when he, he cooled it off to uh, 12 degrees centigrade, uh, um, his one inch line was in, in northern Canada. There and northward, that's where his one inch line, cooling off 12 degrees centigrade in the summer. That's about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's where his one inch line was left after the summer melting and supposedly it would uh, increase with many more years and that's where your ice sheet would uh, start. Uh, but the thing is the ice went clear south of the Great Lakes into the mid latitude. So you need a lot more cooling to get it down that far. And by the way, the glaciers didn't, develop in northern Canada and move at a glacial pace down to the northern United States, in general, they form more or less in place. There was a soft movement because the slope, they moved by the surface slope mainly, and so the surface slope was always be to the south, so you'd have scratched bedrock down, uh, towards the south. So it generally formed more or less in place. So let's try Minneapolis, Minnesota. This would work for many places along the edges in northern United States. The, the summer temperature is average of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's uh, 21 degrees centigrade. That's the high and the low both. So you have to cool off Minneapolis to at least 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But by the way, uh, snow melts mainly by solar radiation, and it can melt at well below freezing. As anybody that lives where I live knows, when you get a spring storm, it dumps a foot of snow, sun comes out, it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit, and it starts melting at 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So when do we get net melting then? What temperature? How far down do we have to go below 32? Well, I went to a, a paper on Antarctica, and the Antarctica gets net melting along the, the, the low altitude edges when it rises to 14 degrees Fahrenheit from the uh, Journal of Quaternary Research. So I'll be more conservative and say that if the average temperature of Minneapolis is 20 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, then the ice the, the ice will start building one inch, cup a foot at a time, then the next year even more. 
So that's a summer temperature drop of 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Where are secular scientists going to get a temperature drop of 50 degrees Fahrenheit for their for an ice age? Um, and by the way, you you need a climate change just not for one summer. It's got to be many summers. So as you can guess, the ice age is actually a severe problem for uniformitarian scientists because they only have to explain this by climate change with present processes of climate change. What sort of present processes of climate change would produce this much of a temperature drop? Well, they haven't really got the foggiest idea. The appeal is something in the past called the astronomical theory of the ice age or the Milankovitch mechanism caused by slight changes in the Earth's orbit with time. And so you get slight changes in radiation, very slight. And they say, well, that, that did it. Well, no, those, that's too weak. And creation scientists, Jake Her Hebert and myself, have written a lot about the Milankovitch mechanism. Um, that is way too weak. So they got a serious problem of finding a drop of 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So as you might think, it, it's a problem. And so a lot of experts on the Ice Age admit this, like J.K. Charlesworth in the book Quaternary Error on page 1,532. Yeah, it was a 1,700-page book on the Ice Age. I loved it. <laughs> it was very detailed. He was a very thorough researcher. He says Pleistocene, by the way, the word Pleistocene or Quaternary is their time scale for the Ice Age. Pleistocene phenomena produced some good theories <laughs> and absolute riot of theories, ranging from the remotely possible to the mutually contradictory and the palpably inadequate. And by the way, there's over 60 theories on how the Ice Age formed. And by the way, that was in 1957. This is modern times, right? And we know so much more. Well, oh, do we? Well, let's get another reference from 1997. U.S. News and World Report dedicated the whole issue to the 18 top mysteries of science. Um, some of you might have noticed that some of these mysteries uh, are strange and are actually mysteries of their own making because they believe in evolution like this one right here. Why should males exist? <laughs> well, in evolution, you should only have one sex that reproduces asexually. They can't figure out why there's a male and a female. And they write books and articles trying to figure out this great mystery every year. And guess what? This is where the biblical worldview has evidence hands down because it simply says in Genesis, God made them male and female. <laughs> but some of these are real mysteries, like what causes ice ages? So that made the top 10. What causes ice ages? They don't really know. In a more recent theory by David Alt about Lake Glacial Lake Missoula and its humongous floods, yeah, they have to believe in more than one glacial Lake Missoula flood, by the way, about 100 of them now during the, their last ice age. Anyway, he says, 2001, although theories abound, no one really knows what causes ice ages. They don't know. It's, it's a huge problem to them. And in 2008, these two researchers said in the journal Nature, the most widely read journal in the world, perhaps the longest standing puzzle in the earth sciences is what caused the Northern Hemisphere ice sheets to come and go. Long-standing, 200-year puzzle. So it is a problem to them. But can we explain it? Can the biblical worldview explain the Ice Age? Well, we need to know when it occurred, first of all. Was it before the flood? During the flood? After the flood? Well, it's obvious it's after the flood because these moraines and erratic boulders are all on surface features with thick sediments below them, sedimentary rocks from the flood. So it obviously followed the flood. So we can place it within a transitional climate between the flood and the present climate. This suggests strongly that the flood may have caused the conditions necessary for such a radical climate change. The Ice Age, and indeed that is the case. So what about the flood would do it? Well, the flood was a great tectonic event, volcanic event, meteorite impacts, um, uh, lots of volcanism. So at the end of the flood, you'd have a shroud of volcanic dust and aerosols. An aerosol is a particle uh, about a micron 
one one millionth of a meter in diameter, and they are so small they float up in the stratosphere for a couple of years, and they reflect some the sunlight back to space, cooling mainly the summer over land. Doesn't affect the water. And doesn't affect the uh, the winters because of other fe uh, heating features. Also, the fountains of the Great Deep and volcanism would cause a warm ocean at the end of the flood. This is a very key feature, this warm ocean, as well as the volcanic aerosols. And these mechanisms would persist after the flood, but wane with time. Wane because the volcanism decreases with time. Also, the warm oceans cool with time. And we can time the ice age by the cooling of the oceans, a very physical mechanism, cooling the oceans. So Genesis flood can fulfill these requirements by the volcanic uh, dust and aerosols during the flood. And even after the flood, there was huge volcanism and the fountains of the great deep and volcanism causing the warm water. Here's a schematic. Uh, showing dust and aerosols. Dust settles out in weeks to months, but aerosols will settle out in a matter of years to even up to 10 years, uh, reflecting some of the sunlight back to space. Anyway, as evidence that there was a huge amount of volcanism at, uh, during the Ice Age, uh, Charles Lewis says, signs of Pleistocene, that is Ice Age volcanicity and earth movements are visible in all parts of the world. You see them, a lot of Pleistocene sediments in a lot of ocean sediments from the Pleistocene. So a lot of volcanism occurred during the Ice Age to replenish the particles that fall out uh, with time to keep the Ice Age going. So here's kind of a schematic of warm oceans at high and mid-latitudes. Um, huge evaporation. And by the way, the key uh, for the warm oceans is the warmer the temperature, the greater the evaporation. For instance, you can evaporate seven times as much water vapor into the atmosphere at an ocean temperature of, of uh, 30 degrees centigrade than at zero degrees centigrade. 86 degrees Fahrenheit versus 32 degrees Fahrenheit, seven times. And by the way, it would be at mid and high latitudes uh, where, where the oceans would be a lot warmer than today's ocean. So you have a lot more water vapor in, in the air at, at high and mid latitudes. And volcanism and dust in the upper atmosphere falling on the cold land. That's kind of a schematic of, of it. So, uh, do we need 100,000 years for an ice age or even 40,000 as the secular scientists claim for each of their ice ages? So how rapid was the ice age? Uh, this is my evidence that the ice age was very rapid right here. This is it, Jenkins. Indisputable proof that the Ice Age caught these people completely off guard. It dumped on before he got out of the outhouse. <laughs> now, seriously, I had to estimate the, 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 the starting temperature right after the flood and the ending temperature when it reached glacial maximum. So what I did was uh, the cooling of the ocean drives the Ice Age, times it. It'll cool by cooling mechanisms, mainly conduction of heat uh, to the colder air and evaporation. Evaporation is approximately three times as efficient as conduction. So by evaporation and conduction, you cool the surface layer of the ocean and it sinks down to the bottom and it, you have a huge overturn of the ocean as it cools. Uh, significant effect for, for uh, uh, the bottom of the ocean, which no creationist has, has really got into yet. So, based on the, the cooling, uh, uh, this, the cooling versus the warming temperature would be the sunshine. So, I use this. It's called a heat budget equation. It's just like um, you turn on the the heater and the air conditioner in a room, and you see which one's stronger. Well, in this case, the air conditioner was stronger. Ended up cooling the room. In this case, cooling the ocean. And so it cools with time, so you can time it. So I assumed we went from 30 degrees centigrade average down to 10 degrees centigrade average. By the way, the average now is 4 degrees centigrade. So you reach glacial maximum before uh, you reach the temperature today. So 
uh, with uh, 20 degrees centigrade cooling. I pl plugged it into the, the heat balance equation and used maximum minimums for these variables because there's no way to be accurate. I just wanted to bracket. So the, I got a maximum of 1765 years and a minimum of 174 years to reach glacial maximum. Best estimate was 50 uh, year, 500 years. Then you got to melt all this. First of all, you got to figure out what the average height of the ice sheets was. So I used maximum minimums for variables and got a range. And the best estimate for the northern hemisphere is 2,300 feet. For Antarctica, about 4,000 feet. Those are, are the best estimates. And then you got to melt it. And the best way to melt snow and ice is to use a physical equation of us that uses physics of snow and ice melt that uses the heating terms, subtract the cooling terms. Once the uh, ice gets up to 32 degrees, more heating uh, uh, causes net cooling, I mean net melting, and it starts to melt. That's how it, how it works. So I use maximum minimums for this uh, heat budget equation for snow and ice. The main variable is the albedo or the reflectivity of the snow. That's a very key variable, and the climate models are horrible at uh, modeling the change of albedo, which changes radically uh, snow ages, for instance. So I use maximum minimums for the albedo, and I got a range along the edge of 40 to 100 years to melt, best estimate 70 years. For the average ice uh, thickness was 40% of the secular scientists, and I there's lots of evidence for that thinner ice sheet than what they claim. I have two articles for the Scandinavian ice sheet and the, uh, and the Laurentide ice sheet in the Journal of Creation of the last couple of years. So time to melt the interior is about 200 years, but the periphery about 70 years. The periphery is along the edge. So the total time for an ice age is only 700 years. This is an example where we use different variables from them. We use biblical variables, the flood, and we get a, a rapid ice age of 700 years. And they claim there's more than one. They used to say there's four ice ages. For 60 years, they used to claim four ice ages. In fact, everywhere they looked, they only saw four ice ages. Now, that's interesting. Why do they only see four? Well, actually, when you um, look at the glacial debris on the continents, you see evidence in most areas of only one. So where did they, where, was there more than one ice age? Well, actually, I believe there was two ice ages. There was one before the flood around the Garden of Eden. And this is the Earth's first ice age right here. <laughs> i got to explain this a little bit. In that when God created man and woman, he created us with no sin. And we had perfect communication at the time. But it doesn't work so well now. And since sin entered the world, communication is broken down. In general, to be very general, uh, women have sensitivity issues and men have clueless issues. <laughs> anyway, um, seriously, there was only one ice age. And in most areas, you see evidence of just a single ice age, like this uh, quote from the journal Geology. Um, a single lake, the title of this, a single late Wisconsin Laurentide glaciation in Edmonton area in southwest Alberta. Edmonton's in central Alberta. Great places for glaciers, uh, ice sheets to, to occur. And so they're saying that there was only a single one. It uh, was in the late Wisconsin and of the Laurentide. Anyway, that's what you see. And notice what they say in that. Glacial reconstructions commonly what? Assume a multiple glaciation hypothesis in all areas that contain a till cover. Till is glacial uh, is, is jargon for glacial debris left over. So they assume it. And if they see some complications, maybe uh, uh, some till here, or maybe some sand and another till, they say, oh, that's two ice ages. That's how they, they did it. And that's how they came to four ice ages until the 1970s. And then the, the Milankovitch mechanism 
uh, took over and claimed there's 50 now in the Pleistocene based on deep sea cores. And how does that work? Well, they, they take these cores and they measure all these variables down there and they wiggle around an average. So then they say, when it wiggles this way, it's a glacial. When it wiggles this way, it's interglacial. I think these are climate changes during the ice age, but they would say each one is a separate ice age. So we would interpret them a lot different than they would. So the, another question, they claim the, the, the glacial interglacial cycle is still here. Therefore, we're, the next ice age is about due. And will there be a future ice age? Well, a lot of people think so. In fact, some people even think global warming will trigger it, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. But anyway, here's the challenge they give us about the next ice age. They say we are still in the glacial interglacial cycle. Interglacials last about 10,000 years. The last ice age melted 10,000 years ago. Uh-oh. <laughs> We're about due. And in fact, in the 1970s, for those people that, that like global warming, we actually had global cooling from 1945 to 1975. Global cooling for 30 years during when carbon dioxide was going up tremendously. That's why there's more to all this global warming than what the hype is saying. Anyway, we had global cooling and, and, and sea ice increased. And so um, a lot of books were written about the next ice age coming. Can we survive it? Articles were published in Newsweek and so forth. And so they said that ice age was coming. Anyway, in the New York Times, this was published. In the past, if the past is any indication, the earth is at the end of another such warm period, poised to descend in a new ice age. That's from the New York Times. And we believe everything we read in the newspaper, do we not? <laughs> I don't hardly believe anything from the newspapers anymore. Anyway, the rainbow is a sign that there'll never be another flood. And the flood caused the ice age. Therefore, there'll never be another ice age. So those out there in the audience that were sweating it can relax. And by the way, this gets back to my title of um, that the Bible explains it. Only the Bible can explain it because of the flood. Now, at this point, I go through the bonus features if I have time, which I do in this case. And besides the Ice Age, you had a lot of other things going on after the flood. Many, many different things going on. Um, just think of that, all that moisture being added by the warm oceans. That would cause a lot more precipitation in areas not glaciated. The climate would be a lot different. The general circulation would be different. Things would be quite different uh, during the ice age. So I've, I've gone into other areas. There's a lot of areas left to go. Um, and these are features explained by this post-flood rapid ice age that the secular scientists cannot. And I'll go through these quickly one by one. In my publications and resources, I go, th I go through these in a lot more detail. Anyway, the first one, deserts that were once wet. In, uh, in Southwest United States, we had all these lakes. Uh, even in Death Valley down here, which I uh, don't show, had a, had a lake 600 feet deep. Here's a lake right here around the Great Salt Lake. It was about 10 times the size of Great Salt Lake, 800 feet deep, while Great Salt Lake right now is only 12 feet deep. So all these lakes in the southwest United States that is semi-arid today in these enclosed basins, how did they get there? Well, I would say the flood probably filled them up to start with. As the flood drained, it, it kept uh, water was left in pockets. And they actually increased. We know that they, they actually grew during the Ice Age. I will probably say a little bit more about that soon. But anyway, you find shorelines from these lakes all over the place. Like here's Lake Bonneville shoreline. There's several shorelines. The highest one is here, the Lake Bonneville level. And the Provo level is a lower one. Anyway, you see shorelines all around where these lakes were. Here's one in um, east of the Sierra Mountains in California where you had a mono lake that was uh, about 800 feet deeper called Lake Russell. And here's the shoreline on it. This shoreline happens to be uh, uh, from, uh, right on a, on a terminal moraine coming out of the valley from the Eastern Sierras. 
So the, 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 what's called pluvial lakes were associated with glaciation because it's right, the shoreline's cut right on a, an end moraine. And here is Southeast Oregon. You find some, some low level shoreline features in the, in the desert areas of, of Eastern Oregon. And the Sahara was wet. In fact, people lived in the Saharas. There's a huge amount of evidence for people and animals. Uh, like this, this drawing, you find tens of thousands of these uh, petroglyphs on rocks in the Sierras. Sierra was green. In fact, James Weller in the Great Sierra says this, the Sierra is a veritable art gallery of the prehistoric paintings. The evidence is enough to show that the Sierra was one of the well-populated areas of the prehistoric world. Yet there is his, man's work, in the most inaccessible corners of the desert. Literally thousands of figures of tropical and aquatic animals, enormous herds of cattle, hunters armed with bows and boomerangs, and even domestic scenes of women and children in the circular huts in which they lived. It was green at one time, during the Ice Age, and even after for a while. So deserts were once wet. This could be explained by the greater amount of water vapor given off by the water, by the warm ocean. The woolly mammoths in Siberia. There's a woolly mammoth. Uh, it's, a, it's a small mammoth. The Columbian mammoth was about three, four feet taller, the largest mammoth in the, in the world at that time. Spiraling horns, uh, had, had three layers of hair. The outside was about a meter long. A, a hump on its head, a hump on its back, and a sloping on the front of its back, shoulders, and a slumping back. Anyway, those mammoths are found uh, all through the northern hemisphere. You can see this red area here, but not in the central areas, the northern areas where the ice occurred, which indicates they're associated with the Ice Age. Uh, some of them are in the southern part of where the ice occurred, and they either were there before the ice uh, got in there or afterwards. So they all went extinct. And uh, so um, them and many other animals, and they don't know why the mammoths disappeared. And this book uh, by Larry Agenbrod and Lisa Nelson says, why did mammoths disappear from the earth? This question remains one of the great unsolved mysteries of the past. Anyway, it can be solved by the post-flood rapid ice age, where probably about midway in the ice or early in the ice age, they got up into Siberia, uh, crossed into Alaska, down the ice-free corridor in the United States, and some made into Central uh, America. So uh, this can all be explained by the rapid post-flood ice age. And why they would live in Siberia? Well, you can find out that if you took off the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean and left the temperature of the water at the freezing point of seawater, which is 28 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, what kind of winter temperatures would you have in the, in the Arctic and in Siberia? Well, this is in centigrade. The North Pole would be 40 degrees centigrade in the uh, warmer in the winter, 20 degrees in northern Siberia. So a lot warmer in Siberia, just getting rid of the sea ice uh, and keeping the temperature of the ocean water at uh, uh, 28 degrees Fahrenheit. But it was probably 70 degrees Fahrenheit at the start of the ice age, indicating you'd have a lot warmer temperatures in the winter over, over Asia. So the animals, some of them that can't tolerate much cold, can round the Bering Land Bridge and into the United States uh, that way. And of course, there's all kinds of onshore flow of warm air into, into Alaska and uh, Siberia. Also, there's a strange mix of cold and warm weather animals and plants in glacial debris. This is called disharmonious associations. And we can explain the, the cold ones during the Ice Age, but what are these warm weather animals doing there in plants? By the way, this is not an anomaly. It's the rule of a mixture of cold and warm type animals. In fact, this book, Quaternary Extinctions, Graham and Lindelius, say late Pleistocene communities were characterized by the coexistence of species that today 
are allopatric, that is not climatically associated, and presumably ecologically incompatible. Disharmonious associations have been documented for late Pleistocene and as Ice Age floras, that's your plants, terrestrial invertebrates, lower invertebrates, birds, and mammals. It's the rule, not the exception. How do they explain it? Well, they don't because their ice ages are bitterly cold winter and summer. But in the, the post flood model, we have warm winters. We have mild winters in many locations. In fact, one of the most outrageous examples of, of disharmonious associations is in Northwest Europe, where we have hippo uh, fossils associated with uh, cold climate animals like mammoths and reindeer. Anyway, early in the ice age, the warm onshore flow in the Atlantic Ocean would keep those areas warm. You'd have a very warm winter. You'd have warm summers for quite a while, early in the Ice Age. So the hippos, and wet, by the way, warm and wet. So it'd be a great environment for hippos after the flood to migrate up into there. But as it cooled, glaciers started to form in the mountains. Uh, they were out of place. They couldn't escape. And so they ended up being uh, buried uh, with cold climate animals. And there's over 100 locations of hippos in uh, England itself. For instance, Don Grayson says in that same book, in the Valley of the Thames, Southern England, for instance, woolly mammoth, woolly rhinoceros, muskox, reindeer, hippopotamus, and cave lion had all been found by 1855 in stratigraphic context that it seemed to indicate contemporaneity. In other words, they lived together. They try to separate them into interglacials and glacials, but why would, um, we're in an interglacial now, why would a hippo want to migrate up to England in this interglacial? Doesn't make sense. Anyway, there was mass extinctions at the end of the Ice Age. Why is that? Well, here, here they are. A hundred uh, species of large animals disappeared in North America. That's 70%. And these are animals over um, 100 pounds. Europe and Asia lost 40%. Australia, 90%. South America, 80%. Africa, only 20%. That's the latest statistics. They've changed a bit because of more uh, further knowledge. Uh, they don't have a good statistics from Southern Asia, but Northern Asia, they do. So why is that? Well, they really don't know. In fact, it only happened after their last ice age, which is kind of interesting. Why didn't it happen after the other 49 ice ages? Well, maybe those other ice ages did not exist. So it's a radical climate change at the end of the ice age. Instead of uh, warm winters and, and cool summers, uh, which support your disharmonious association, winters became even colder than today. Summers gradually warmed, the ice sheets melted, melted sent fresh water over the, the high al uh, latitude oceans forming sea ice right away. So temperatures got a uh, lot colder and drier and so forth. So th th this has been a mystery for 200 years. A, a book published in 1999 said, after many decades of debate, the North American end Pleistocene megafaunal mass extinction remains a lightning rod of controversy. The extraordinary diversion opinions expressed in this volume show that no resolution is in sight. Some think it was climate change that did it. Some think that man did it in a, in a huge slaughter. Some think that man spread diseases. So um, lots of controversy. Uh, some believe in more than one. Anyway, they haven't been able to solve it. So they got a lot of problems that the post flood one can explain. Anyway, here's the one about the unglaciated areas in Siberia, uh, lowlands. That's where you find the woolly mammoths and, and the other animals. In Siberia and Alaska, there were 40 different, at least 40 different uh, types of mammals besides the woolly mammoth. Um, and they're found in permafrost, that is fro permanently frozen soil at the surface. And there's millions of them based on the statistics I've seen from the Russian scientists, especially the New Siberian Islands right up in here and, and the coastal areas adjacent to that. And if the sea level dropped 100 meters, Huge areas of the continental shelf would be exposed. So it'd be no problem for them to go from Siberia and Alaska. And early in the Ice Age, there would be a, a ice-free corridor caused by what's called downslope phone winds, 
off the Rocky Mountains from uh, nor uh, northern Canada down into Montana where I live. And so that's where the animals pass through that ice-free corridor. And when they try to model glaciation, it's very hard to produce glaciation in these climate models because they're so imperfect. Anyway, one model actually produced glaciation in 1994. It was published in the Journal of Climate. Anyway, they're celebrating. Uh, we got glaciation now. Siberia and Alaska and the Yukon, including the lowlands, were among the first to glaciate. The first places to glaciate. They're great places for glaciers, but they weren't glaciated during the Ice Age. Anyway, they say, we now have glaciation, but mainly outside the area where it existed during the last Ice Age. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, the climate models have lots of problems, which is why I'm pretty skeptical again, again, about catastrophic global warming. A little bit of global warming, I think, is true, but not catastrophic. In summary, the Ice Age was a real event not that long ago. It was real. We have to explain it. It is a major mystery for evolutionary Earth science. Noah's flood caused the transitional climate for an Ice Age. Yeah, Ice Age lasted only 700 years. We don't need 100,000 years for an ice age. There was only one ice age. Only the Bible explains the ice age because of the flood. That's going back to my subtitle. And there will be no future ice age. A few concluding remarks. Creations have a viable mechanism for the last major event in Earth history. While evolutionary scientists are far from a solution. Then why should we believe them for all those older hypotheses? Hundreds of older hypotheses about uh, the evolution of this beastie and its death and extinction. They have all kinds of just so stories, as I call them. Why should we blame for any of them if they can't explain the Ice Age? Another concluding thought the Ice Age is an example of what can be done with hundreds of other earth science challenges to the Bible. And this is crucial time is not a side issue. Some people are embarrassed by a short time scale. But a young Earth timescale sometimes is a key to solving major mysteries that have been lasted for 150 years. Well, how so? Well, they know that the volcanoes cool. And so, but, you know, the, the aerosols uh, settle out within two to three years. And it came up that they were pushed up in the upper stratosphere about 10 years. So each vol volcano going off, is stretched out to tens of thousands of years, becomes insignificant in the long, big picture. And so they discount volcanism as a major cooling event because of that. But what if we telescoped all those volcanoes that are post-flood, and even the, the ones that occurred during the flood? By the way, there's 700 stratovolcanoes, and they're probably all active during the uh, Ice Age. If we telescope all that volcanism to within several hundred years after the flood, we have a major cooling mechanism for the summer. So time's not a side issue, but it's key. Another more concluding thought, the Ice Age is based on the flood. Therefore, the flood, one of the most despised events by the culture, is a real event of the past. Therefore, it is easy to believe the whole Bible, which tells us how to live here on earth and how to go to heaven. That's ended, but I'm going to tell you about some of my resources. Um, I've been working on this for over 45 years writing articles and books. So as a result, I got a lot of resources out there for all ages, all technical abilities. In fact, I'm publishing another one on the Ice Age, an in-depth one uh, is being reviewed by uh, um, uh, Creation Ministries International. Anyway, my main book for layman is Frozen in Time, the Woolly Mammoth, the Ice Age. And it's actually uh, been changed, the biblical key to their secrets instead of just down the Bible. Uh, and as far as ice cores, see, there's a lot of subjects. I, you know, ice cores are a big challenge, but when you delve into it and look deeply at it, they're not really a challenge at all. Anyway, there's a book you can get, and it's it went out of print for a while, but now you can get it print on demand from Institute of Creation Research, the Frozen Record dealing with the ice cores. Yeah. And if you like DVDs, Kyle Justice filmed me showing these features in the Northwest states about the Great Ice Age. And also he did it for the, the Lake Missoula Flood, the Great Missoula Flood. And I even have a book on the Lake Missoula Flood. 
uh, comparing what happened, what, what did the Lake Missoula flood produce? And comparing the landforms that it produced with those that you see on the surface of the earth today from the runoff of the floodwaters. And we see the similar landforms, but at a huge scale for the Genesis flood. And so you can get that. Oh, keep doing the same mistake. Gotta go. And we have some children's book that my wife and I did. Um, teaching about the ice age in story form. It's a, it's a fun read for young people and adults alike. And we have a sequel, Uncovering the Mysterious Woolly Mammoth. And for those that uh, need something, a primer on geology, uh, I wrote Exploring Geology with Mr. Hibb. The Ice Age has got a lot of geological stuff. So I've gotten into geology and geophysics over the years. And so uh, this is one of the resources I have for, for children, grade six and up, and even adults. There's one on dinosaurs, too, I might add. And I wrote the weather book, which has been updated. Um, for newer materials, a homeschool course also. And if you really want to know about global warming, I have a talk you get from CMI, uh, the great global warming debate. I go, I go through the data and tell you what the data really says. Anyway, I want to leave you with this verse. Your faith, from 1 Corinthians 2, 5, your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men. That The wisdom of men is, is the doctrines from the Enlightenment. Deep time, the, ch the flood is, is not real. Evolution that came later, by the way, uh, because of uniformitarianism. It should depend on the power of God. God has the, the power to cause a flood to create and uh, do an ice age. No sweat. That's where our faith should be, not on the wisdom of men. And here's a few websites that would aid you. Creation.com is my favorite has over 11,000 articles for various age groups um, and, and uh, various um, uh, depth to them. I have a website, michael.owards.net, and on that I have two free ebooks you can get. Just uh, read them. One is on the evidence of the runoff of the floodwaters in the field of geomorphology, the evidence that we had runoff that produced all these features on the surface of the earth that they can't explain. And then I have another book on where is the flood post flood boundary? Because I've worked an uh, uh, inordinate amount of time to figure this out because I have to separate what occurred during the flood and what occurred during the ice age so that I have an ice age explanation for what occurred during the ice age and a flood for the flood. And so you can get this ebook and I've published those, those, uh, that book in a lot more detail on the journal of creation. So I'm, I'm gonna open it up to, for questions now. And uh, and pass it back to you, uh, Donnie or uh, George. Still there? Yes, yes. I was on mute, uh, Mike. I, I didn't want to give you any background noise during that awesome presentation. I've got to say uh, that hour flew by. I can't believe it's over already. I'll be re-listening to this probably tonight. So much good information, Mike. Um, actually, if you wanted to... Just click that stop sharing button real quick. Okay. And I think our main screen screen should pop up. There we go. There we go. We're good. Um, I, okay. I want to point out, I want to point out, Mike, a couple of thoughts that, that came to mind was um, I, I love how you, you point out that the global flood of Noah itself is the perfect event that fulfills the requirements for such drastic climate change, right? Necessary for the ice age. Yes. As biblical creationists, we have an explanation for the ice age. While the uniformitarians struggle to explain the necessary conditions for their multiple ice ages. And- Cutting out. Oh, am I cutting out there, Mike? Yeah, hey, yeah you're cutting you out, can... so I didn't, didn't catch that. Okay. Uh, it looks like your camera's back. Yeah, it looks like it was it was cutting out a bit. George, could you hear what I was saying, brother? Was I cutting I, out at all? I could hear you, but uh, Mike's camera was freezing up a little bit, so I think that's why yeah. he couldn't hear you. 
Yes. Oh. Yeah. It, it looks, uh, it looks good yeah. though. It looks like whatever, whatever you did, Mike seems to be fixed. Um, but overall, I just want to point out great presentation and I want to thank you so much, Mike, for all your Welcome. amazing work. And I, last thing I'll say before we get into some questions, I'll hand it over to George. We've got a great lively chat. I want to thank everybody in the chat for their amazing support. We've got a ton of questions, super stickers, super chats coming in to help with the show, help with the ministry. But I like the way you ended it there. You pointed out that a young earth that the scoffers deny is key oftentimes in solving the major mysteries that have been around mm -hmm. for over 150 years. So <laughs> that yeah. was a great point. And that really resonated with me. So uh, thank you, Mike, George. Uh, I'll yield the mic and hand it over to you for a few words, brother. Yeah, I, I'd just like to add uh, a couple of things to what Mike actually said in support um, of uh, the Ice Age. Um, for those that don't know, there's been some con considerable amount of work being done on fossils in Greenland where they found fossilized leaves and they could identify the species of these or they could identify these leaves to a species of tree. And they found that these trees would only uh, actually survive or grow in moderate Mediterranean type climates. So Greenland, for example, was once moderate in terms of climate and also from um, written uh, historical records uh, from the Vikings. For those that don't know, the Vikings actually moved to Greenland and they mm. actually um, cultivated crops like corn. So Greenland was once lush and green. And as mm -hmm. Mike mentioned, these mammoths would have moved to where all the green vegetation was and they moved further north. And that's how they got caught in that ice age and buried by it so mike i hope i hope i haven't said anything contradictory to what you you said but that's what i know about uh greenland and some of that area adjacent to it okay um you got to determine what is flood and what is post flood there yeah greenland has warm climate uh vegetation that um in the Cenozoic, as they they would call it, but uh, this goes along with uh, warm climate vegetation in uh, northern Canada, um, Siberia, and Antarctica. Um, you find a lot of uh, paleoflora, as they call it, showing warm climates at at high latitudes. So this just drives them crazy. In fact, um, the the last one with the Pliocene, which was just before the Pleistocene, that had very warm climate. So it's very difficult for them to explain that. But I believe that that's from the flood, that the vegetation, as well as some of the animals, um, like lemurs in um, the Axel Heiberg Island and Ellesmere Island and the Queen Charlotte Islands of, of Canada, 80 degrees north, uh, all these uh they were, tra were, tra were transported up there by the flood, is what I've concluded. Um, now, there is a report that underneath the Camp Century ice core, they recently realized that there is some vegetation at the bottom. Uh, they found a, the, the, the bottom core after being missing for 50 years, and they analyzed and they found leaves and uh, twigs and saying, well, it melted about uh, 200,000 years ago. I mean, they think it's been there for millions of years, by the way. So I'm going to write a little article on that for the, the Journal of Creation starting tomorrow. Um, so that's post-flood there. And, um, yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of interesting things uh, on the paleoflora. And I've published several articles on the paleoflora before. Now, now Mike, Mike um, there, there are skeptics, and they point to ice core data where – they identify deuterium and oxygen 18 isotopes. Yeah. And um, they actually uh, cite um, peak, peaks in the ice cores to identify eight unique uh, uh, periods, suggesting there could have been yeah. up to eight ice ages or glacial events 
which sort of yeah. uh, goes against uh, that one ice age that you mentioned. So how do you actually explain mm -hmm. those uh, ice cores and the isotopes found in them? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, I've got a five-part series being published in the Journal of Creation as we speak. Uh, two parts have been published. And the next issue, which will come out in about three months, um, maybe part three and four will be there. I've, I've reviewed, I've, I've, they've, re they've reviewed the, the, all the first four parts that are sent to me. I've sent them back. So I'm trying to, uh, I go through all that stuff. Well, first of all, you look at Greenland and also West Antarctica, you see evidence of only one ice age there. <laughs> You get only to the bottom, you find what they believe is more glacial, but that'd be the warm period uh, uh, caused by the warm water uh, before it glaciated on, on Greenland, for instance, like the lowlands of Greenland where those those deep ice cores are drilled. And But it only shows one ice age. It's only East Antarctica that shows many. And uh, at Vostok shows four. It's Dome C that they key on that shows eight. And it's by the wiggles and the oxygen isotope uh, ratio. Um, first of all, uh, they date these ice cores by matching them to the same wiggles they see in deep sea cores, which were dated by assuming the 100,000-year eccentricity cycle in the Milankovitch mechanism. So it's all big circular reasoning network on how you date uh, Antarctic cores, because you can't date by the annual layers like you can in Greenland. It has nice annual layers just at the top. They, did, they, they're, they thin out and they get diffused and messed up midway down there. But Antarctica has too little uh, snow each year and it blows around, so you can't have annual layers. So you got to go by assumptions. <laughs> so they date it by deep sea cores, which are dated by Milankovitch. So there's a huge circular reasoning network, not only with ice cores, deep sea cores, but pollen cores, lots of other things that kind of fit it all into this Milankovitch mechanism, uh, they claim, uh, that cycles because of the changes in the Earth's orbit. Jake Hebert and I have written a lot of papers on the, this subject. If people want to look at the, the in-depth literature on it. But we would explain like the dome C, let's take the dome C at his eight wiggles. First of all, those first four wiggles low down are not very impressive. They're they're not they're not very big wiggles. It's only when you, the 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 top four wiggles where you really get some good oscillations in there. Well, I in this series of papers I'm doing, and it's the same thing in Greenland, uh, but different. There, there's a different situation, but. It, in Antarctica, I believe that these oscillations with rapid uh, accumulation of ice are decadal oscillations in volcanism that occurred after the flood that are unique to each hemisphere. Each hemisphere is separate because uh, you don't have much exchange uh, in the atmosphere or the oceans between the hemispheres. And so the volcanism in the southern hemisphere determines, uh, causes the, the lower uh, uh, more glaciation, faster accumulation, and uh, other variables that are correlated with it that, that causes uh, the glacial wiggles. And when you have a low in volcanism, um, uh, it goes to the, the it goes up. So I've correlated all these things and uh, due to decadal, now decadal oscillations are oscillations that are, are a couple decades, maybe anywhere from 10 years to 50 years. on uh, it's, a, it's a time scale. And this would occur during the post-flood rapid ice age, during ice buildup, you'd had these, uh, causing these oscillations. And I, I published the basis behind this is uh, in 1990 in my in-depth book, which is out of print, um, uh, that, that is due to uh, uh, oscillations of volcanism in each hemisphere. Well, that's an incredibly informative answer, uh, Mike. That was awesome. I appreciate that. We do have a um, a super chat that came in. A, a super chat is is just where our supporters 
uh, will donate to the ministry with a question attached to it, Mike. So this question comes from uh, Nephilim Free. I appreciate the support and the question. He says, question for Ord. Is there much movement towards accepting that ice layers do not represent individual years in the scientific community? Oh, no, there's no movement in the scientific community. They've assumed they've been there for millions of years. And each annual layer, and like on the top of Greenland, and like this on um, West Antarctica, too, uh, that's about that thick of ice, about uh, 20 to 25 centimeters. And as each uh, buildup each year, it pushes it down and squeezes it to the side. So each annual layer thins and thins. And if you assume it's been there a million years, uh, each layer becomes so thin, it's as thin as a dime by the time you reach the bottom. That's your annual layer. Uh, in our time scale, you can have um, six meters of uh, ice for the first several years. And so it would compress some to say three meters, but all the wiggles from storms are not diffused out when you have a, a higher precipitation rate. So they would be counting storm layers and layers within storms, these oscillations, as a year. Well, we would consider them storms or within storm oscillations in various things like oxygen isotope ratio. Because the, 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 the storm layers, annual, uh, oxygen isotope, has an amplitude about the same as the annual la uh, layer in Greenland. So that's the difference. And they're, no, they're totally into uniformitarianism, millions of years. And they have this model. Uh, they date it by flow modeling is one of their dating methods. So it becomes paper thin. And so they count all kinds of wiggles. You, we know that, that there's a lot of circular reasoning going on because when they first counted in Greenland, they got 85,000 wiggles. But uh, when they got about near the bottom of the of the GISP to ice core, drilled in early 1990s. And it counted 85,000, but they said it was wrong because, according to the Milankovitch theory, it sh should be 110 layers by that uh, level. So guess what they did? They went back and redated the bottom 500 meters using a sophisticated laser light uh, mechanism that that has a resolution instead of eight millimeters, it's one millimeter. And guess what? It got a lot more wiggles down there in that bottom 500 <laughs> meters. And it magically became 110,000 uh, layers uh, down or years to, at the bottom. Wow. Circular reasoning based on the Milankovitch or astronomical theory of the Ice Age. I, 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 I know this is a bit of rough, rough maths here, Mike, but I was doing a bit of research last night. And I got these uh, numbers from the Australian Government Antarctic Program. Um, they, they, they state that the mean thickness of the Antarctic ice sheet is uh, 2.16 kilometres, with the maximum known thickness of the ice sheet is 4.8 uh, kilometres yeah, in, the in the Terrier Dell. Now, now I, I, being an engineer, I, I like a little bit of math. So I sort of compared that with the... Um, the average um, uh, snowfall or uh -oh. thickness of, of ice above. Sorry. Oh, so I think um, Mike was just is cutting out a little bit there. Mike, it looks like your camera <laughs> might be frozen. Let's. It looks like we got you back, Mike. It so I'm not sure. It looks like it. Anyway, I see a lot of questions. Uh, chat mike it looks like your um it looks it's like your, freezing your camera might be freezing maybe oh. mike maybe shut off your camera for now and we'll see if we can save some bandwidth but well it looks like we got you Stop back mike camera i guess that's it looks like we do have you back, though, Mike. Okay. I have a lot of um, questions that are piling up here. I see them. Yes, yes. I, I, I want to get to these questions. Maybe we'll do a rapid fire. 
Q and A. Uh, Mike, are, are you hearing us again? Is your is your connection back? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, my yes. recommendation. Okay. Okay. Perfect. My recommendation would be um, next time if it does happen again. Oftentimes, if if you click the stop cam button right next to the mute mute button, okay, that'll save bandwidth and and you won't have that issue again. Okay. So, um, so George, we're gonna. We're going to fire through these questions. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. There we go. Yep. There we That's go. Good. So that should solve the the issue. Okay. Um. So our, our next question would be, um, well, let me see here. A question just came okay. in. At least, I could put, at least I could put this one on screen. Question from Baldy Cat. I appreciate the question. What is Michael's view on climate change records specifically? I'm getting uh, um are are we losing you again, Mike? Yeah, I I can't hear him. He might. He might want to, I don't know if it's an internet issue or what, he might want to jump out of the stream and then jump back in, just kind of refresh it. Because the last time he was on, we had him on for almost three hours with no issues. So maybe if he wanted to just refresh it. Mike, can you hear us at all? Yeah, I, I, I'm hearing you now. Okay. Okay. So, Sometimes an easy fix is to leave the stream and then click the link and come back in just to refresh it. But if you can hear us now, we can we can kind of move on and hope that things are fixed from here. Okay. Okay, we'll try this for now. Send a um, question. Okay, so the question uh, comes in from Baldy Cats. He asks, um, what is Michael's view on climate change records? Well, um, they've been taking measurements of temperature. Now, there's a lot of uh, glitches in those temperature records. So they claim about 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 1 degree centigrade warming since about 1880. But, um, and especially in the polar areas where it's amplified because the snow is, and ice is melted. Um, so I believe all those records, um, but I th think the temperature record may be exaggerated, but, but I'll take it for data to start with. And we you know the CO2 has been going up, but we can run correlations. Uh, Mike, it looks like it looks like you're kind of breaking in and out. I think we're losing you. Did you want to maybe exit the stream? Rising. Yeah, Mike. Mike, we can't we can't hear you. It might be a good idea to leave the stream and then come back by clicking that link. Oh wow! That standing sent you in the email. It sounds like it's a it's a connection issue, possibly on your end, Mike. So sometimes, if you were to, we've had this happen before with guests on, and typically when they leave the the show and then kind of refresh and come back in, usually that fixes it. <clears throat> And then, um, George, yep, I'm going to go over a couple uh, reminders and announcements for the, okay. Um, I'm going to go over a couple announcements, George. If you wanted to mute yourself and give Mike a quick call, because he did, he did give us his number to give him a call if there's any glitches. And at the same time as you're doing that, I can go over some reminders with the, with the audience. Might be a good time. So um, I wanted to remind everybody that tomorrow 
We have our third event for the Genesis Flood Week on Standing for Truth. We have Sal Jardina back with us. Uh, we're going to be discussing how geology demonstrates and confirms the flood. We're also going to be having a Q&A. That kicks off at 8 p.m. EST. So make sure you're here. Bring your questions. should be a lot of fun. It's going to be Sal's second time with us. And let me see. I think I got... Mike, it looks like your camera is, can you hear uh, me, Mike? We've got you in the stream, Mike, but I'm not too sure if you can hear me or if your connection's improved at all. Okay, we'll wait for George to... Call. I, I don't I don't have his email with his phone number standing. Okay, here, let me get it for you real quick. Because it's definitely a connection issue. Um, let me see. I'm gonna put it in the, the private chat, George. Okay. Just, just one second. Hello. Oh, there we go. Mike, Mike, we got gotcha. you. Can you hear us, can Mike? He? I got some great questions here. Yeah. yeah. Are, is, the, is the connection improved, Mike? Can you hear us? So, what are we going to do? Uh, we can definitely start asking you some of these questions, Mike. I just want to make sure that your connection is okay and you can hear us at this point. <laughs> Are we coming through, Mike? Can you hear us? Okay, I'm going to give Mike a call real quick, yeah. just so. States and the for connection. The internet's up. We do see a couple comments in the chat. Somebody saying that they had this earlier on their podcast. The internet gremlins are out today. He's saying, uh, uh, "Can I, can I, can I suggest something?" Standing, Michael, is there someone else in the household that may be using the internet at the same time? Okay, here I'm going to go on a um, intermission here, and I'm going to give him a quick call. So I'm going to put the. So we'll be back in just a few minutes, guys. Just so we can fix this, we'll try one more time with Mike. He's coming back. Any improvement at all, Mike? Okay, we'll be back, guys. I'm going to, on a brief intermission, I'm going to give him a call. Uh, yeah, there. Uh, Mike. Mike, can I can I ask, is there anyone else in the household that may be using the internet at the same time as yourself? No, because I have the laptop up in my office and I have the other computer here. So okay. no, I got both computers. And I can hear you. I heard that. Maybe there's an improvement. Uh, we might be good now, Mike. So is is our audio coming in okay now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Maybe we're in luck. Maybe it was just a couple minutes there of connection issues. But if you can hear us, we can jump right to the next question if you want. Okay. Let's go for it. All right. SF All right. SFT, standing, would it help if you turn off your camera as well? I can try. I don't think it's coming from my end, but we'll see if there's an improvement. And there's so many questions there. So George, since I just asked the one on climate change, you pick one of those questions and, and we'll run with it. Maybe we'll go with Ryan, the Raptor guy's question, George, since he asked it a, a while ago. Go ahead, brother. Uh, okay. Uh, Mike. Um, yeah. Ryan, the Raptor guy has asked the question. Does Dr. Ord think the unfossilized rhinos, horses, and other animals at the Ashfall fossil beds 
are from the flood or post flood? I'm not familiar with the ash fall fossil ah, beds. Is, right. is he talking about the Ashley fossil fossil beds? No, ash fall fossil beds in northeast Nebraska. I'm familiar oh, okay. with them. All right. Um, that was a tough one. I had a debate with uh, Carl Frody about it. He thought they were post-flood. I examined it twice, the site and other features. And even though there are features there that would indicate post-flood, uh, I determined I think it's flood. And I gave several reasons. I see I've got, I have 33 criterion to determine the boundary and I use those criterion. Um, one of them was uh, uh, a formation of, gra of, uh, of uh, gravel, quartzite gravel from the Rocky Mountains that was spread clear out into Nebraska that was associated with them. And that's a flood signature, a spreading of, of, of resistant uh, gravels. Um, by gravel, I mean uh, up to cobble size out there. And that that's to me is a big signature that it was from the flood. Um, and let's see, what else? There were several other things. Um, and, and some of the animals that were fossilized were not ones you see during the ice age at all. They were, uh, they were uh, some really strange ones. Um, but like I said, there are other other indications that it, it's from the flood. So that's a tough area. Most areas where I've evaluated the flood, post-flood boundary, I've found it fairly easy. But that's one of several that I found it difficult. And I had to look at all, all the data I can before I made up my mind. And I think it's from the flood. And I've written about it. It's in the, the Creation Research Society quarterly, what I wrote about it. And what Carl Frody wrote about it. Uh, Mike, my, my, one, one of the uh, evidences that I point to with the Ice Age is the um, frozen stomach contents of the uh, animals that were fossilized. You know, in the secular mm -hmm. um, uh, sort of scenario where you'd get an Ice Age occurring slowly and gradually over time, that that piece of evidence just contradicts that slow, gradual ice age. Um, and uh, would you like to talk about that fro the frozen contents in the stomach of the mammoths as evidence for um, a global flood and a quick ice age? Well, it would be um, evidence that they were uh, frozen pretty fast. So the main... Yeah question has always been um, how fast um, bird's eye frozen food company said well it has to drop instantly to 150 degrees uh, centigrade or Fahrenheit I forgot which uh, below zero flash frozen in other words and I looked at the data and um, found that um, as far as stomach contents you've you find some stomach contents uh, with mastodons uh, in the Northeast United States, and no one believes that they were flash frozen. Um, also, the state of vegetation in the stomach indicated different seasons of, of death for those mammoths. And a flash freeze would have happened all at once in one instant according to people who wrote written about it. And uh, so different seasons indicated that he died at different times. Um, also, I examined the digestive system of for elephants. Elephants and mammoths have, are very similar. And the digestion system, it doesn't die, the food does not digest in the stomach. There's acid there that partially breaks down the, the vegetation. The digestion occurs after the stomach for uh, mammoths and and elephants. So the, the stomach is just mainly a holding pouch for um, their food, and it's partially decays, but you have to freeze it fairly fast. So I postulate a moderate freeze from uh, cold fronts 
from when it was a lot much colder in winter in Siberia than now. Um, and they're interred in the permafrost because they're in windblown silt and the permafrost comes up into the windblown silt as well as the cold air freezing it from the top. So it was a, a moderate freeze um, at the end of the ice age. And that's when they all went extinct at the end of the ice age. I hope I answered that question. Yes, you did. Um, that was a great um, great question and great answer, Mike. Here's a question that um, has come in quite a bit, a question that I have on my mind as well. And, and since you're here, and I know you've written on this in your book um, that I've got in front of me, Rock Solid Answers, the question essentially is, do varves the existence of varves contradict young earth creation and the global flood mike oh yeah well a lot of secular scientists think so but when you look at that uh extensively which i've done i wrote a two-part article on it in the 1980s in the creation research society Quarterly, so I especially examined the Swedish bar. Uh, first of all, you got to realize that these barbs are really rhythmites, alternating um, two or more subcouplets. Um, they're rhythmites that form in one year, they believe. But we, you can form rhythmites uh, in, uh, like turbidity currents, uh, distal or or the finer turbidity currents will have multiple rhythmites. Um, we, uh, in the in the Muir Inlet um, that that has been it was glaciated in about 1700. It the glacier has been receding, and you've had heavy sedimentation, and you've had uh, rhythmites form as much as one per day. Uh, from uh, the the mud and stuff that is that's given off by the glaciers that's re, re, uh, receding. Um, so you can form more than one year. So they're not necessarily varves. They have to prove that they're a one year uh, cycle, and they can't do that. And these this, these varve scales are are just short sequences. of rhythmites, maybe about, I will say, 200 in one area. And then you go some, and they try to match the wiggles in the varves, the dark and the white layers and the thick varve layer uh, sequence with the bottom of another. And so that's how they did this all the way up to uh, in Sweden north and, and got about 10,000 years. They did it in Northeast Canada and the, uh, I mean, excuse me, Southeast Canada, the Northeast United States also. And um, it's all superficial and based on uh, uh, assumptions that there really are bars and that you can really connect them like that. Uh, dozens of, of sequences uh, connect the bottom and the top of, of one or the other. So. Yeah, you have mechanisms to form rhythmites uh, fast and um, a lot of different uh, types of, of uh, scenarios. So the varv, uh, varves really uh, do not show what they think they are. They're based on too many uh, uniformitarian assumptions. Yeah, well, yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike, on, on, the, on that one... Um... I believe there were uh, uh, cores done at uh, Lake Sagutsu in Japan, and in two of the cores, they found uh -huh. ash layers, and the number of layers between the ash layers were different. So if they represent um, years, then why did we get more, um, I guess, valves in one core than the other? Oh, yeah, uh -huh. you have those situations. Also, the Green River Formation uh, has six million of these rhythmites in some places. And, yeah, they don't correlate between ash layers there either. So 
there's a lot more going on. And you can form these rhythmites rapidly by especially turbidity currents, distal, what they call distal turbidity currents. That's the, after they're been transported a long distance, they thin out. And they and they form layers. They they form layers, and so you find a lot of these in the rock record. These uh, rhythmites, and so um, they are always trying to make a case that they're barves and or one year oscillations. And it's it's uh, it's speculative on their part. And uh, so a lot of this, like the Lake Sagistu, if I pronounced it right, in Japan. A lot of this stuff is just um, dated by assuming the Milankovitch mechanism, and that stretches out the, the first, the last ice age, a hundred thousand years, and so forth and so on for each other ice age. And so they blend things into these time scales. And a lot of this is circular reasoning uh, with with uh, dating methods that are uh, questionable and based on assumptions and uniformitarian assumption. So there's a lot more that that uh, I can say and write about it. There's a lot more research projects involved in all this for the uh, post-flood uh, time scale. Anyway, that's about, about all I can say about barbs. Yeah, that's a really helpful response, Mike. That was really good, and I appreciate that. Um especially on such a common objection from the uniformitarians, an objection that, that they almost say is unanswerable by us. But, you know, as you've shown here, you've given a great answer. I appreciate that. This question I have here, Mike, ha um, kind of brings us back to the post-flood ice age in terms of biogeography, because the question is, Mike, do floating log mats, do you believe they help explain at least some of the Earth's biogeography post-flood? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Land bridges. There was a land bridge between France and England that broke during the Ice Age, and that's how the hippos got over to England. There's a, there was a land bridge um, between uh, Siberia and Alaska. And I think this land bridge was exposed early in the Ice Age because uh, some of the mammals that I analyzed that rounded it uh, and where they're found um, uh, told me. I, in fact, I wrote a paper on that in the Journal of Creation, I think about a year ago on the land bridge, but others have to be explained by the log mats. For instance, I think there are Australian marsupials have to be explained by log mats. Um, first of all, I, I have a paper that I've submitted to Journal of Creation on these marsupials. And, um, uh, first of all, when they found, found them, uh, they thought they were all Pleistocene, which means the ice age period. But then because they date, they actually have a unique dating system for those marsupials. Uh, it occurs in South America and North America, too. It's called stage of evolution. So when they find um, a marsupial, a particular marsupial, they say, well, that's a little different than what we expect. It's got a primitive feature here. Oh, primitive. Oh, it's got to be older. So let's shove it into the Pliocene or the Miocene. So they keep shoving these things back based on the stage of evolution. That's how they've been dating there for years. They have very few radiometric dates to 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 uh, lock all this in, and so it's all a house of cards. And then, then I always try to explain how we would explain. I mean, uh, the Lord's led me to um, to answer challenges, and so I got to say, how did they get there? Well, I think the only way we can explain them, they couldn't have got there by a land bridge from Southeast uh, uh, Asia because there's too many deep straits in Indonesia uh, between Southeast Asia and Australia and New Guinea. And so I don't think they could have uh, uh, got there on a land bridge or they, I don't think they could have gone there by island hopping either. So the only uh, possibility is by uh, log mass where they, they, they migrated south, maybe in mass. I don't know why they stood to, stayed together, but it appears that they stayed together and ended up on the shores of the Indian Ocean somewhere. 
and they log mats were floating around. Some were beached, and they they got on these log mats, and they were spread um, hither and yon, and ended up in Australia, probably northern Australia to start with. And uh, other features of uh, that I noticed that would support this is that some of the animals that were had to be on log mats were snakes, uh, and and other creatures besides marsupials and some um insects so th and they couldn't have got there by even a, a land bridge uh so they have to come by a log mat regardless so the log mat idea i think uh seems pretty strong and so that's the article's in review right now and maybe it will come out in a in a year depending on how fast Publishing is very slow, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes it takes three years for something to get out to, that I do. So it's I find it frustrating that it's so slow. By the time I, they get back to me, I've forgotten half of, of about what I wrote. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see how that would be frustrating. We kind of talked about that last time. And um, it, it's even frustrating for me. I'm addicted to reading these articles and papers. Uh, you know, I've spent a great deal of time reading through your huge number of uh, articles and papers coming out of CMI. And th this question I have is it, it pertains to some articles you've you've submitted in regards to some possible objections regarding the fossil distribution of animals post flood, including the marsupials as it relates to your position on the post-flood boundary. Now, I, I know we could probably talk about that all day, but for the audience's sake, especially some of the new viewers, I was wondering if you could touch on, on some of the content in those articles and papers that you've submitted in, in terms of refuting those objections, uh, Mike. Oh, okay, let's see. I submitted them six months ago, four of them. The Australian one was actually there was two of them for Australia. One was to explain how we, how I would explain how they got there, and second, he to critique what the uni the uniformitarian ideas. Then I had one on um, North America. Um, uh, the 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 key question is. We have a lot of mammals in, in North America in the Cenozoic. And it's claimed that they have to be post-flood. Um, so that's that's been the question all along. And, uh, I, you know, I've examined that. And first of all, uh, the person that challenges me on that set up several straw man arguments saying that that if I believe that those Cenozoic mammals are from the flood, what I have to believe is that before the flood, that they left North America, rounded the Bering Land Bridge to where the Ark was, somewhere in Asia. And then after the flood, they migrated back to exactly where, after the flood, uh, for the Ice Age fossils, and they died exactly on, on their Cenozoic uh representatives in the cenozoic rocks well first of all um we don't have to migrate them from north america to where the ark was they could be living near the ark or on one big land mass north america wasn't existent then secondly it was claimed that the climate would be too cold for them to round the bering land bridge in siberia they were thinking a present day climate no, during the Ice Age, it was a mild winters and cool summers, as I said in my talk. So a lot of them would have no climatic problem rounding the Bering Land Bridge uh, after leaving uh, the Ark. And so mammoths and 40 other creatures, mammals, came into Siberia, Alaska, then the, down the ice-free corridor in Alberta and Montana, into the southern United States and Central America and South America. That's how they they would go after the flood. And so, uh, so that there was some straw man. But anyway, um, I looked at the North America genera uh, that were supposed to be 
uh, in the Pleistocene uh, defined as post flood, and the pre Pleistocene was as defend, defined as a flood from my point of view. And I found out that a lot of these North American mammals, see, it's the claim that why would they, they migrate just to North America and die with their ancestors? Well, the problem is they're not necessarily North American mammals. You find them on other continents. You find them in Asia, in Europe, Africa. So we're not talking about a unique North American mammals rounding the barren land bridge and dying all above its Cenozoic ancestors. From my point of view, no, uh, uh, not at all. The, the, and the, the, the Cenozoic mammals could be transported long distances from who knows where. So I've answered mo a lot of that uh, stuff, but um, there's still questions that need to be explained. And I was pl planning on writing two or three more papers, but I got bogged down and uh, other projects that have not got back to that. So it's been six months since I sent it in and I haven't heard anything yet. So I don't know how it's going. Well, but I got to anyway, say that's a quickie on no, that. That's great. That's a great answer. Extremely helpful. And um, I got to say, I'm looking forward to hopefully those articles being released at some point and therefore going through them and reading them. So that was a great answer. And I, I think, um, we all wish there was just more time in the day, given how many projects, I mean, just how many projects you want to get through. So, um, George, I, I know you had a, yeah. a question as well, brother. Yes. I, I don't want to hog the mic here, but George, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Mike, uh, there's, there was a question from uh, Andrew P that was uh, posted early into our presentation. He, he's asking how to explain, and I hope I don't butcher this, and I hope you understand uh, my pronunciation of it. He says, asking how to explain lacustrine indicators in the GRF and the Bidahotchi formation, such as exploded fossil fish, basin-centered paleocurrents and ma craters. That, that well, question is in the, in yeah, the private chat that. if you want to read it yourself. Yeah, I did. Um, oh, there's a lot that can be said. you got to figure out where the flood post flood boundary is and all this stuff. Um, and there's ways to interpret, uh, like, the Green River Formation as post-flood lake. And there's other ways to look at it. Um, uh, John Whitmore and I had a debate about this very subject in 2006 in the journal of creation. You can get it all online from creation.com. And anyway, he pointed out what he thought was a post-flood lake. He wrote his PhD thesis on the fossil fish in the Green River Formation. We spent a week together out there looking at various features. And one feature I noticed he overlooked was that the huge amount of erosion in the area. That's the thing that first got me. Uh, you go to uh, one of the basins, Fossil Basin, and you can go up uh, over 2,000 feet up a slope. And all the sediments in that whole area were at least eroded 2,000 feet. Now, that is an incredible amount of activity after the flood, but that's not the, the end of it. I discovered in um, the southern part of the Green River Formation uh, that the Green River Formation was part of the what's called the San Rafael Swell. That's a big uh, uh, a bowing up of a strata, about 80 about 100 kilometers north-south and about 40, 50 kilometers east-west. And the middle of it got eroded off, leaving the edges dipping away from the center. And by trigonometry, I calculated based on the eight-degree dip of that of the strata to the north, with the Green River Formation being the top formation, I discovered that the San Rafael Swell was eroded about 17,000 feet, 17,000 feet Oof. Uh, of erosion in the center of it. 
and the Green River Formation was the top formation on and that San Rafael swell. So what does that tell you? If it's post flood, you got to deposit the Green River Formation over a huge area, forty thousand square miles, up to six kilometers deep near the Uinta Mountains. Six kilometers deep, and then you got to bow up this swell, erode it. All after the flood, rolled 17,000 feet. And where'd the sediments go? They're not found anywhere nearby. They're swept clean off the continent. This is an obvious flood signature. And I published this article. You can look it up in 2009 in the Answers Research Journal. Not only that, the Green River Formation has so much oil in it that it has enough energy to supply the energy needs of the United States for 100 years. Where are you going to get that much oil um, after the flood in a lake and get that thick of sediments over a huge area? No, it, so much of it doesn't make any sense for a post-flood lake. But like I said, there are indications there that are, are would indicate that. So something happened in the flood to account for some of those features that they talk about as evidence for the post flood lake, and there were, and John Whitmore did challenge me in a few areas of on that, and I haven't any answers on a flood for me. The flood waters were draining, so that's um, it for the uh, Green River Formation. The Betahoche Formation uh, is a little more complicated. Uh, um, you're going to see something about that for those that actually subscribe to the journal journals. Um, recently, Steve Austin and two others uh, defended the dam breach hypothesis for the origin of the Grand Canyon, which I believed at one time until I went out there and looked closely and found so many contradictions that with time I gave it up. Um, I didn't give it up right away. I, I was hoping those that believed in it would answer it. Uh, Bitahochi formation is, is part of this. But anyway, they wrote in the uh, early 2020, they wrote an article in the Answers Research Journal. Well, anyway, I've done a response that will be published in the Creation Research Society quarterly in the next issue, uh, going through their challenges and uh, answering them. And uh, the Bitahochi formation is uh, – um, yeah, it's intriguing. It's mostly a volcanic or fluvial deposit. There's a little bit of what's called lacustry. Now, by the way, lacustry, and this goes along with a lot of other paleoenvironmental deductions. Those are all based on uniformitarian assumptions. Lacustry, generally what they call it, they define it as lacustry. They find some uh, rocks, cobbles, rounded. Well, that's automatically fluvial up from a river and so on and so forth. They got dozens of these paleoenvironmental interpretations, all based on crass uniformitarianism. You bring the flood back, and these things uh, are not necessarily lacustrine, even though late in the flood, you could have some pockets of, of lacustrine uh, that look like lacustrine formations. That's probably how I explain the Green River Formation. Um, so fluvial, of course, would be runoff. I find a lot of rounded rocks in uh, Montana and Washington and Wyoming and uh, that were eroded from the west, uh, western Rockies clear out into central Saskatchewan, southwest Manitoba, central North Dakota, 800 miles from their source, uh, rounded rocks, quartzites, resistant tough rocks and they would just say these are from rivers well they're they're all over the place they're they form sheets billions trillions of them um east of the continental divide they they came from west of the continental divide 800 miles so to them this would be fluvial to me it'd be flood runoff so so you could see that the various mindsets define the terms so the term lacustrine is is a very vague term as well as many other paleoenvironmental interpretations. I hope that answered the question kind of in a roundabout way. 
Well, yeah, yeah. Well, that was a very in-depth answer, actually. I think Andrew uh, would be happy with that. Um, uh, I'm not sure where SFT has gone, but I, I've got just one more question to ask with regards to um, uh, the magnetic polarity changes. I, you recall I mentioned the uh, ice cores earlier. But yeah. they, cl they claim that there's been a number of magnetic polarity changes uh, in those ice cores. How do we explain those? Um, let's see, I don't believe that they're in the ice cores. They're in deep sea cores. Oh, sorry, yes, yes, you're correct. Um, well... Humphreys, I think, has a great mechanism that uh, during the flood, there was a lot of oscillations uh, in the magnetic field reversing rapidly. You can look in his material on that. and then it, But it continued after the flood and, and damping out during the Ice Age. And I go along with that model. Um, yeah, this is uh, and then they got a whole time scale called the standard polarity time scale. Um, and this was developed in the '60s by potassium argon dating. See, they had to they had to date all these accurate so that they can get reversals and normals uh, with time. And I think there was a lot of fudging that went on in all that data. But by the way, in the '60s, the potassium argon dating method was not very good. And so I think there's a lot of shenanigans that went on in, in developing this polarity time scale. But be that as it may, we need to explain the evidence for reversals, and, and which are about 50% reversals in like lava rocks and in uh, marine sediments too, and the normals. So I would, uh, I would use uh, um, Russ Humphrey's. Uh, uh, a mechanism for the the, uh, the magnetic field. I think it's a pretty good uh, model, and uh, that that explains them. And they they continued for a while during the ice age. And by the way, they talk about dating these things. Um, they have um, if you saw the uh, the polarity time scale, the last reversal was about seven hundred eighty thousand years ago. Um, went from a reversal to the Brune's normal, and they they use that they use that that boundary to date other things. By the way, lots of circular reasoning. But when you look at the literature on this, I should publish an article. It's one of those many articles I need to publish, but don't have time. When you look at the Brune's normal, seven hundred eighty thousand years, you look at it, and there are short segments of reversals through it, about 10 of them, where the polarity went from normal to reverse really quick, and they call them excursions. One of the main ones is called the last camp excursion 42,000 years ago on their time scale, where it reversed for and lasted several hundred years and went back to normal. Well, with so many reversals and normals throughout this time scale, you can have very precise dates to really pinpoint all this stuff. And that's where the problem lies, is that uh, you, you can, it's just too complicated for them to really do that. The dating methods aren't that precise. And there's so many of these reversals, not only the main ones, but also these excursions, which are supposed to be tiny ones that last a short time. And sometimes they don't reverse totally the whole way. And so, so many of them, it's just a mishmash of polarity changes. So I consider it a big problem. By the way, paleomagnetism doesn't date anything because it's just a sequence of reversals and normals that if you include a faster sedimentation rate or a hiatus somewhere, you can make any sequence in the deep sea cores fit the polarity time scale by adding uh, faster sedimentation, slower sedimentation, or a hiatus, a gap. And that's what they've been doing all this time to make everything fit and look like it's really consistent, and it's not. 
anyway, I should write an article on that. Anyway, the, what they do is they have to date these reversals by other mechanisms. Say, is this, they got to say, is this sequence um, Pliocene uh, four million years ago, or is it Cretaceous a uh, hundred million years ago? So they date by other mechanisms to put the same sequence in various slots. And the, the, uh, so it has to be dated by other mechanisms. So in itself, it's not a dating method. It depends on the date, other dating methods. Same with the Milankovitch uh, cycles. They depend on other dating methods uh, to calibrate it um, for what time period is the Pliocene, Cretaceous. You don't know unless you date it by another method. So there's a lot of uh, circular reasoning and correlating one dating method to another. So there's a lot of problems in all that all this. And I've only uh, touched on the part of the iceberg above the water. Well, I, 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 I just want to say one thing, George, because yeah. I, I want to point out how um, I, I love how thorough your answers are, Mike. And there's just so much good information even in in just this one show we've had people in the chat point out you know they're going to rewatch this a few times just to get all the information I, I really love your passion on these important topics and a question that came to mind based on what you're saying because to be honest with you your your answers are so informative and thorough that you're you're answering a lot of questions that we have all in one for example mm -hmm. the dating method question I've heard the critics, I've heard the uniformitarians say, we've got so many different dating methods that all corroborate each other. They all co correlate oh, yeah. on deep time, right? But from the sound of it, you're pointing out that, the, is that based on circularity or, you know, what's, yes. what's the answer to that? Yes, it's based a lot, uh, mostly on circularity uh, where they correlate one method to another. In fact, uh, Marvin Lubinow actually demonstrated this because, you know, they don't publish a lot of dates, so you can't really check all this stuff. Anyway, there was a big dispute over Leakey's 1407 um, skull. I think that's the name of it. And they had to piece it together from several hundred pieces. And, uh, and it was first dated 2.8 million years by six different methods, one of which was paleomagnetism, two were fossil dates. Um, so six methods, and they all agreed it was 2.8 million years, and that's what they published. Oh, but the pa paleoanthropologist said that skull, which was pieced together, looked is too modern. It can't be that old. So they redated it and used five out of six of the previous dating methods, and lo and behold, they got 1.8 million years. <laughs> and five, five of them agreed with that. <laughs> and um, so <laughs> he's in his book, um, uh, Bones of Contention, he, the first edition he has it, but the second edition he left it out. And I, oh, I, I, I really had a problem with that. But anyway, it's published online on, on uh, creation.com. You can, you, can, uh, uh, you can obtain it there and show how these were all correlated make them look precise. It's all through circular reasoning that they, they did this. And this is probably just the tip of the iceberg for, for this sort of thing. Cause we can't verify. Oh, by the way, he found some, if they found some old dates on some of them uh, to over 200 million years for some of the dates that they got back with uh, argon, argon or potassium argon method. I can't remember which. And then they read, they threw those out, and then they got other dates that were six million years and uh, four million. They got a, anyway a lot of dates. Anyway, they they pick and chose the dates that were closest to what they expected, and it's admitted by. I got a great quote where they actually pick and choose the dates that agree with what they believe from geology. Um, and John Woodmerapi has other great quotes in some of his books on how they. That they picked the, the date that they believe is just true out of out of probably a smattering of dates. So anyway, it's all a bag of worms. And the, if people want to know more about it, I actually have a book on dating uh, mm -hmm. called the <laughs> um, the Deep Time Deception: Examining the Case for Millions of Years, uh, right. put out by Creation Ministries International. 
So I do touch on these things. It's this is for this book was written for total laymen that have no science background. So it's not very deep. They want to get some deep stuff. Look at Andrew Snelling's uh, stuff. And uh, but anyway, this is for laymen to get them started and to uh, show the case that we do have a we, we can defend a young Earth. And uh, there's lots of problems with these dating methods. I've I've got that quote, uh, Mike. If I can read it. Uh, it's by the it's by E H Andrews, professor of materials, University of London, and head of the Department of Materials at Queen's Mary College. In a book, God, Science, and Evolution, he he says, "quote Whatever the figures arrived at by the dating tests, they are weeded out before publication in scientific journals. If they do not accord with the preconceived dates assigned to the evolutionary geology column." And then there's another one by um, uh, Richard L. Uh, Morga. He's an associate professor of geology at East Carolina University. He says, in general, dates in the cor correct ballpark are assumed to be correct and are published, but those in disagreement with other data are seldom published, nor are discrepancies fully explained. And I've got more quotes uh, <laughs> that, that say that, but... Uh, yeah, the K the KBS tough is a is an embarrassment, isn't it? Uh, with the um, yes, the the range of dating methods that they used and the range of dates that they received that contradicted yes. each other. Right, I hadn't heard those quotes before, but I got other ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, there's thing. heaps of them. You just have to search. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's quote after quote of, of them admitting to the circularity. Mike, um, I, I want to point out that that was a great answer, and you have you have so much good material available for for everybody. That's why it's such a blessing to have you on. And um, I, I wanted to ask something based on what you were saying earlier. You were pointing out how you've had some uh, you know cordial debates and, and dialogue with fellow creationists on some of these issues, right? And uh -huh. yes, I have. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I've read so much on CMI, but I do recall, I believe that you've had a written debate <laughs> on some of these issues with Dr. John Baumgartner. Correct. Okay. Okay. I, I was I was kind of curious. What were a couple of those issues? What was, I guess, what was the debate on, you know, the bigger picture? I find that interesting. And I have read through that. It was a while ago, but it, it kind of came to my mind when you pointed that out, Mike. Yeah, I think it was in 2002. Um, There's an online debate in the journal Creation with John Baumgartner and myself on catastrophic plate tectonics. Um, as some of you may know, the, I, I believe there's evidence for it, but since I read um, or try to keep up with 50 earth science journals, I find a lot of contradictions, problems with it that aren't solved yet. And I wish they'd work on them and solve them. And I can I, I can easily believe catastrophic plate tectonics. But I see so many problems with it that uh, is why I am uh, skeptical of it at this point. Um, <clears throat> so there's, um, for instance, I've done a, a lot of work on, on what's called subduction zones, uh, trenches. There's lots of anomalies there that uh, qu uh, make one question the plate tectonics and the catastrophic plate tectonics model. Um, but what I just published in the journal of creation maybe three or four years ago was that I don't get into this too much. It's a subject I don't really like getting into. I don't spend a lot of time on it. But I do publish a few of them now and then. And one was, what, four years ago where I discovered that there's these um, deep sea um, uh, fans, that's right, deep sea fans that started on the North American plate and spread onto the Pacific plate during the Cenozoic. They dated the Cenozoic. And, and if there was motion of the Pacific plate uh, compared to the North American plate, which is about six centimeters a year to the Northwest for the Pacific plate, uh, in relation to the North American plate, which includes not only North America, but Alaska and Northeast Siberia, 
<clears throat> you should have seen um, about a thousand kilometers change, and you should see no consistent deep sea fans going from the North American plate to the Pacific plate during the Cenozoic. And yet you do. You have one that actually crossed uh, from southern Alaska, from Alaska, went south. And it's called the Zodiac Fan. It actually is a, uh, south of the Aleutian Trench. And even the fan is south, and it's a oh, couple hundred meters thick. It's very wide. They know it came from Alaska. The paleo current directions and stuff indicate that. And, and, it wouldn't it wouldn't be consistent. You wouldn't have been seen a, a fan like that from Alaska if the Pacific Plate was moving relative to Alaska. And then you go to the northwest uh, part of the Pacific Plate. You have the Miji fan that started the North American Plate and spread on onto the Pacific. And there's no disruption of that over the thousand kilometers it should have moved. The plate should have moved relative to each other. So I find stuff like that. And that's published. You can check it in the Journal of Creation. Um, there's another one, the the which isn't so convincing. It's the Monterey Sea Fan that spread from North American Plate near Monterey across the Pacific Plate, and it doesn't show any north-south uh, movement between the plates for all the Cenozoic that that fan supposedly was being deposited. So I find lots of glitches. I think down the road I'm going to spend more time looking at it. And uh, right now I don't spend a lot of time on it. And so 2002 was the last the debate I had with John Baumgartner on it. It's pretty old. And so um, you can read it on the uh, creation.com website. And so he believes what he believes. And I, I believe a little bit of what he believes. But... Um, I was a weather forecaster for 30 years, and so I, when there's a lot of uncertainty, I would give probabilities. Like, it, you know, there's a 20% chance of rain today. You know, you've heard them. And anyway, I use probabilities for some of these things. And so I give catastrophic plate tectonics a 20% probability of being right, 80% chance of being wrong at this point. But those probabilities can change with further information. I might end up believing in one of these days, but I need to be convinced on a lot of anomalies. Well, so many great points there, uh, Mike. And I do remember reading that. And I, I, I mean, I'd, I'd recommend all of the articles and papers that we've kind of referenced and sourced today. Um, I, I want to respect your time because we are going on two and a half hours and therefore maybe out of these thousand questions we have, maybe I'll pick out one that kind of sums up many, because there's a question here that, that I believe does so. And the question, Mike, is, and I believe you've written on this too. I remember reading an article on this. Um, are fossils as neat and organized as the evolutionists would have us believe? Or are there any out of order fossils? Mike, what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, okay. Well, there's certainly a lot of out of order fossils uh, with overthrust, but I believe that many of these overthrusts are real. I was skeptical at one time, but I've come around to believe that most of them are real. Um, yeah, I, I, run a, I run into them now and then. Um, for instance, dinosaurs. Um, there's about, I've run into six research reports of finding dinosaurs above the Cretaceous into the Paleocene or Paleogene as the Europeans would look at it. And they've been eggs or tracks or something like that or bones. And um, there's a statement by uh, a famous dinosaur researcher that says that that we actually date the strata by the dinosaurs. You find a dinosaur, it's automatically older than 65 million years, and we don't find them above. So they, there's a lot of some circular reasoning there. And these other ones, they claim were reworked 
that you have that one where it, uh, uh, in the Paleocene, it was eroded from a Cretaceous sediment and the fossil went with the erosional debris and was deposited in the Paleocene. So that's usually what they, they say. Uh, but eggs and tracks, you can't do that because they don't erode. <laughs> um, so they just simply redate the strata and say, hey, this is not Paleocene, it's Cretaceous. So they do that. But one in the San Juan Basin in New Mexico, they found some big dinosaur bones out there that were claimed to be Paleocene, above the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And uh, the guy is sticking to his guns. I haven't read anything on it, but these are big bones. You can't really rework a huge dinosaur bone from the Cretaceous up into the Paleocene. So um, I haven't seen any responses. I haven't seen what they say about it. It's just kind of left hanging. As far as I'm concerned, they don't probably don't know what to do or say. But this is kind of how they do. So you're not going to find too many out-of-place fossils because they make them in place, a lot of them. But there is order to the ge uh, geological column and the fossil order. Uh, I go along with the general geological column and a general fossil order, but I've run into enough exceptions that I'm kind of skeptical of a precise order. Uh, that they claim occurred based on evolution over deep time. Mike, uh, in, a, in a recent debate on this channel, uh, an atheist um, who was debating a Christian stated that um, if there were fossils found, dinosaur fossils found above the uridium layer, that uh, was caused by the Chicolup uh, impact, then that mm -hmm. would disprove evolution. I've got news <laughs> for that guy. Di dinosaur bones or dinosaur fossils have been found above that iridium layer. Yes. Paleontologists have. have reported on it. Right. And th they just uh, explain it away um, by several possibilities, of which I mentioned. Um, Two, reworking and just redating the strata. Yeah, that's why it's unfalsifiable because they, they always have a rescue device for whatever contradictory piece of evidence that we find. And that's why it can't be a scientific theory because they have all these rescue devices. That's right. Rescue device is a very good term for them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd wonder... Uh, George, if that specific individual you are talking about, if he saw that information that he said would convert him away from evolution, if he would actually convert or do what uh, Mike said, rework and resort to circularity, because I would probably bet on the reworking as yep. we're so good at. So, <laughs> yep. um, that being said, yep. uh, I want to respect Mike's time. We're going on two and a half hours, and I want to thank the audience for so many great questions. I mean, we could probably ask questions all day, and Mike, I could listen to you all day. You're in, you're incredibly thorough, and uh, your presentation was was awesome. It, it's a must watch. Um, it's it's an honor to have you on, and we're happy to have you on anytime again in in the future as well. So, Mike, thank you so much again for giving us your time. I also want to hand it over to you for some final thoughts. And, and some final words. Um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you're you're welcome for the uh, compliments, and I hope it really blesses people. In fact, that's the point of the ministry that the Lord's led me to to try to answer questions. And so I've done this, and there's a lot more to go. And so um, that's why I keep re uh, working uh, full time, including Saturdays. Um, so, um, yeah, I just, uh, hope, uh, hopefully the Lord will give me good health my later years. And so I will keep on keeping on and I hope it blesses, uh, people. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen yeah. You will be in our prayers, of course, because you are an incredible blessing, and this really was a blessing, and, and so many people are profiting from it. Your answers have been incredibly helpful. 
Uh, George, thanks for joining me as well to help uh, host this event that, that I think was so, so great. Uh, George, did you have some final words, brother? Uh, yeah, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank Michael as well, but I'd also like to apologize to him because it seems these streams just give him more ideas for more articles to write. So sorry, Michael. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never yep. ending projects. Yeah. yeah, I'm working on one that's going to be at least five parts right now. Um, they actually discovered or actually have measured the amount of sediments in the ocean. And so I'm working that backwards because that sediment came from the runoff of the floodwaters, practically all of it. And you know what? The, um, the amount of sediments in the ocean indicate that the amount of erosion on the continents was about 1,900 meters. 1,900 meters was eroded during the recessional stage of the flood and it's in the ocean various places especially the continental shelf and they all got this all measured all over through the ocean it was it's pretty hardcore and um so i'm working that and it's and working it backwards to say what does it say about the late flood first of all a lot a lot of huge erosion and i've calculated three areas of erosion that are giving me no big numbers so it's about right and then we got to say well we got we have about mm, 3,000 meters left of sediment on the continents. The exact number is variable. We, we're getting various researchers that give us various numbers. I'm doing this with John Reed and, uh, and Peter Klebberg. And um, so if you have 3,000 meters and add another 1,900 meters for approximately 5,000 meters at the peak of the flood, what is this saying about the early flood? you got to generate enough sediment to uh, have 5,000 meters at the peak of the flood. Wow. Where does that come from? I mean, there's a lot of questions working it backwards. I got, we got five papers already uh, semi outlined out and I've, I've done almost the first uh, two. So uh, that's what I'm working on right now. And, and, and Mike, we, we've done a f a f quite a few streams on erosion. I mean, the the, uh, the secular erosion rates suggest that the Earth's um, dry landscape should have eroded uh, within 10 to 12 million years. So that's a problem for them. Even when right. you consider orogeny or, or uplift, right? You, you still you still can't get that figure down <laughs> on like 10 to 12 million years. Like that's like. Uh, the landscape eroding 300 times in that um, in that life of the earth, the deep time life of the earth. Right. They got a lot of uh, problems trying to explain that. Um, but I'm doing is I'm trying to explain from the flood uh, what's there. We finally yeah, found yeah. out what's there in the oceans. And I'm trying to figure out uh, uh, what's there on the land. And I'm getting different numbers but it's getting to be about 3,000 meters about, <clears throat> if I averaged several of them. <clears throat> so um, that the sediments, where they're at, they, that tells us a whole lot, huge. I think uh, at least five papers are gonna come out of this and probably send them to the Creation Research Society quarterly. So your, your readers should uh, subscribe to the Journal of Creation, the Creation Research Society quarterly if they don't. And they see all kinds of good stuff, new stuff by me and a lot of other creation scientists doing research. And did you recently speak? It must have been a few years ago now, but on the um, the creation conference, the latest one, I believe it was, Mike. Uh, which creation conference? I think it was, was it 2016 or... I can't quite remember what I'm not sure if it was on the recessive stage of the flood or it, I, I could be wrong. I've got it. I've got it mixed up right now. I'd have to look it up. Uh, but yeah, I, I would definitely press my audience to subscribe to the journal of, of creation where tons of good information is, is constantly coming out. And I think you said it last time in our presentation, Mike, where, we all know we could attack evolution in deep time all day. They got so many problems. Right. But 
you are seeking to answer some of the tough questions, some yes, of the you know problems with with the flood I itself, and and I really respect that because you're you're coming up with so many good answers to essentially some tough questions and objections sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the ice age after the flood that both both periods. Right, and and that um, kind of brings us back to the topic that we were here today, uh, you know, to present and discuss the the post flood ice age. The ice age being best explained through, you could say, the ripple effect of the flood itself. So I, mm -hmm. I really, so I, I really appreciate this presentation and, and the time you've given to us, Mike, because I think our our previous presentation was about two and a half hours as well. So I think we've got almost. Yeah six hours of uh, answers and, and amazing information from you, uh, Mike. So I, I cannot thank you enough. I, I know George uh, as well is extremely excited for these. So thank you again, Mike. Thank you. To, thank you to the chat and, and all your questions and God bless everybody. We'll see you tomorrow for another flood presentation with, uh, with Sal, Sal Jardina. So everybody, God bless, God bless Mike and God, God bless, bless Michael. Yeah, you too.